Hello there, friends. Um, welcome to our directing panel. Uh, let's start by introducing ourselves and uh, just let people know what you have directed in the past for BFR. So I can start. My name is Jess, and uh, I recently directed Hand to God by Robert Eskins. I'm Sarah Zapian, and I directed Voice of Sound's production of Hamlet. I'm Alec, uh, and I, or Alec Lachman, uh, great start. <laughs> Alec Lachman, and I directed uh, Voices Found's production of Richard III, Macbeth, and Henry V. My name is Andy Montano, and I directed Voices Found Repertory's production of Coriolanus. All right. Uh, so let's start. What? Just talk about um, talk about uh, your concepts and how you get started. Um, if you want to talk specifically about how you came up with a concept for a certain show um, and any like outside factors that come into play when you're trying to uh, figure that out. Um, let's start with Andy because you're right be here. Sure. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this and I'm really excited to be given the opportunity to look at all of my old Coriolanus notes again. Um, so the production uh, of Coriolanus that we did was the second show that VFR put on uh, after the success of Romeo and Juliet. And it was by invitation of uh, Jake and Alec and encouragement from them that uh, they, they said, hey, you should try directing. We wanna see what you can do. And uh, I really took a leap and they were there to really help me out with it. So that's what uh, inspired me to try uh, my hand at directing Coriolanus. Um, the concept of it and the timing of it, I think were perfect. Um, you know, no, no big deal. But uh, <laughs> the uh, when the play went on, it was just at the final end of 2016. And if we all ha remember what happened at the end of 2016, the political climate was very, very uncertain and stressful. Um, it was a lot, it talked a lot about people. Um, the whole concept of Coriolanus was people questioning their governments and what happens when, uh, people are allowed to follow blindly whoever is in front of them. And um, so we, that's why we decided that if everything in this play is looking really familiar, that's why we should do this play now. Um, as far as the concept goes, one of my favorite movies, favorite, favorite movies is uh, Mad Max Fury Road. And of course, set in the post-apocalyptic era. Uh, the post-apocalyptic era, I think, was really, really, um, it was, I would say, advantageous to us just because it allowed us a lot of flexibility and, uh, and freedom. So uh, after doing some research about it and see what we had to do, the, uh, the post-apocalyptic environment allowed both the designers and the actors to really uh, explore and have that sort of flexibility with what their view of the, what the post-apocalypse looked like. And how it was also really exciting to see how neatly Shakespeare's show fit into that environment, which also speaks a little bit, I think, to the timelessness of it. Um, it also, uh, on the more practical end, a lot of the materials that we used were found materials or donated or thrifted. So it was actually pretty cheap for us to get a lot of our set and a lot of our, um, a lot of our costumes as they were all set in that sort of concept there. Um, another thing that uh, was really was really great and what we uh, w reinforced what we wanted to do as far as VFR goes in the realm of auditions was uh, there was our second uh, workshop. It was our second casting workshop that we had after auditions. So we were able to get the people that we wanted on our team first and then see how they interacted with each other. And based on that, that's how we cast the show. And let me tell you, when I saw, first saw auditions, I was like, oh, I think I know my cast. But then that workshop happened, totally different. Totally different than how I expected. But uh, I was a really big fan of how that um, turned out. And uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much how we did the concept, why we decided uh, to do the play, when we did it, you know, uh, I have a poster, I'm looking up at it uh, right now, and it says the final months of 2016, one of Shakespeare's most violent politically charged plays feels shockingly familiar. 
I think I would love, I would have loved to redo this play again, like in November, uh, just because this Coriolanus has been used by both the left and right throughout many, all, all of history pretty much as a very, uh, as a great way to do a commentary on uh, politics. And it was just, it was just so great to see our, our group really p perform a show that made people go, huh, afterwards, really made them think and uh, really appreciate a show, at least one of Shakespeare's shows that isn't seen very often. Um, typically we see uh, Coriolanus's, uh, one of Coriolanus's speeches used for auditions like a lot. Uh, you common cry of curs whose breath reeks. Uh, yeah, that one. Uh, that one we, uh, we see a lot, but we don't see the whole show in context. So we uh, are able to see his, his rise and fall um, almost empathize with him at the time. So by the end of the play, you don't know who's the good guy, who's the bad guy. Um, it just has so many different things that work really well for it, at least in my opinion. And uh, probably, I had, a, I had so many favorite moments and of this play and mostly they were, they're very personal. Um, they were very, they were intimate moments where it was just a couple of people there but when they were there, they saw something really cool. Uh, the biggest, the biggest moment that I, that comes to mind right away was the first day that we brought the, uh, we had these sh wooden shields that was that were built uh, by by Ethan, and their riot shields first came in, and everyone started picking them up and like was wielding them and like, oh here, how are we gonna do this? Uh, oh maybe we can all stack them over over here. Maybe we can do this. And I just stood, I remember this distinctly standing at the back of the room, that tiny rehearsal uh, room at the Underground Collaborative and seeing an entire group of artists do their thing, do the, do the creation and exploration and the, having the epiphanies of like, oh, I could do this, oh, I could do this, oh, I could do this, all, all happening all at the same time. And it was just, it made my heart really happy and really reinforced that this is really something that's possible and it really a show like this and like any show in, at least in my opinion it really the crux of it lies on the people if you have good quality people and good quality artists you have a good quality show and they're able to overcome anything uh we had a couple of uh rough patches uh, throughout the production i mean what production doesn't but uh, I believe with the, and I really strove for this and it's something that I wrote down that I can work on and more in the future is to be more open, more communicative of what we would need to do in order to, you know, solve problems earlier and uh, really just make a quality final product. Because at the end of the day, it's the, the play is the thing, right? The play is the thing. Um, also, I wanted to especially shout out my stage manager, Caroline Betcher, uh, for keeping me super, super focused and super, super on task uh, during the entire production. I don't think I could have done it without her. And um, definitely to the, the uh, assistant directing of uh, Jake Russell Thompson. Um, he was really the guiding light for a lot of the things that I did, including the dissection of the play where we took the whole play and like put it all up on my wall. There was paper all over my wall and about, you know, identifying the key moments and where's the through line and um, learning all of those things, especially a department in a realm I didn't really know uh, all too well, um, was really informative and gave me a deeper appreciation for what a director does and how they interact with the other departments, uh, both on on stage and off and what they, what what a director needs to do to maintain the focus and vision of a play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing with us, Andy. I didn't know that that was your intro to directing. My very um, first show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so exciting. Um, and you mentioned a little bit about VFR's casting process, which is actually really cool and different than a lot of theater companies. Um, so I'm sure we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, but let's jump in to Sarah, because you're next on my screen. <laughs> All right, let me on. Okay, so um, 
what was the what was the original question one more time? It was just like about the beginning process, right? Yeah, or, like how you come up with your concepts uh, or anything uh, okay. that you want to say about getting started. Okay, so if you want a longer version of this answer, you can check out the Build a Bard video two that I talk more like in depth. But I would say, um, I guess when I first read Hamlet, I was a senior in high school and it was required reading for 12th grade English, but my English teacher was brilliant. She was lovely. She had us read it on our own. We read it out loud in class. We listened to Kenneth Branagh's tape of it while we read it so we could read it and listen to it. We watched scenes from his movie and then at the end of the semester, we all performed scenes from it. So it was a very like immersive, process and um and that was the first time that i really connected with shakespeare so that's why hamlet really means a lot to me because i remember reading hamlet and just thinking like oh my gosh this isn't some like middle-aged white dude like holding a skull and like pontificating right like that like image of like Ugh. like it's not that it's this confused conflicted kid who doesn't know what he's doing. He has no idea what he's doing. That's why the play is so freaking long. It's because it takes him forever to figure out what to do and how to do it and what's the right thing to do. And if that's the right thing to do, what are the repercussions and what does this mean? And it's, 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 it's a complicated play because he doesn't, he's not perfect. He's young and he's figuring things out. And that's why I wanted to do Hamlet. Like I'm, I'm sure I'm going to direct it and be in it several more times because um just because to me like it was really important for me to direct it and like be a part of that show while i'm like in this age period of like early to mid 20s because that's i think that's who the play is really for it's for millennials it's for people who are like expectations are being set and it's like okay like when are you going to get your life together and this guy's like, I don't really know. Is that okay? And everyone's like, no, it's not okay. You have to figure it out now. And I'm like, who doesn't feel that pressure, right? So that's kind of like, that was like my jumping off point. Um, and why I wanted to have the play set in the here and now. And that I wanted it to be like a, sort of like a younger-ish cast of like 20s and 30s and um and sort of have those like little like nods to the elizabethan like culture so that's why we had like certain um like cuffs and like ruffles and things to sort of like nod to that because i think that is kind of that's really important um because the the constraints and the confines of that society is part of what makes that conflict so like um so tense you know, Ophelia can't just be like, like, screw you, dad, I'm going to do what I want. Like, no, like, she has to obey her dad. Like, she has to do these things. So without those constraints, the play doesn't really work. So that was kind of my, my jumping off point as far as, like, the concept goes. Um, yeah. And it's definitely a play that I want to do again as I, as I continue to, like, mature and learn more about myself and about the play in general. So, nice. yeah. One thing, um, actually, I just thought of too that you mentioned um, in your initial video, you talked about um, having a metaphor for the play that you're doing, and I thought that was really cool. Did you have? Do you remember like what your metaphor was for Hamlet? Um, I had a few, but I think one. I think the. It was. Uh, I think one of them was, it, it was similar to like playing with matches and then burning something down. Um, like, a, like a child getting into their parents' um, medicine cabinet. Like it, it's, kind of, it's kind of graphic, but I think of like a little kid getting into their parents' medicine cabinet and accidentally cutting themselves. And then before they know it, they're just covered in blood. Um, actually that's like, has to do with like a, 
like a personal story of mine. It ends happily, like I'm alive and everything, but like the mo like I'm, it can go from zero to 100 in like no time at all. So I think that was one, playing with matches and burning your house down. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right, well, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, yeah. Alec, uh, you have a few different shows that you can draw from. So if you just want to um, can touch a little on all of them or your favorite one or whatever you want to do. OK, uh, and the question is how I come up with my concepts. Yeah. <clears throat> is that, OK, um, so I mean, directing a show for me is a, a lot like designing a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. Honestly, I pull from a lot of different media sources and inspirations that like I that I like. Um, you know, I, I like to say I have original ideas, but I'll, I pull from a lot of different things. Uh, and kind of referencing what Andy said, if I'm speaking specifically about uh, the last two shows I directed, which was Macbeth and Henry V, um, to what he said about kind of the timelessness of the plays uh, and Mad Max, um, and I pulled into kind of the, specifically if I'm talking about Macbeth, that post-apocalyptic kind of era. Um, but also, as like uh, Russ Bickerstaff said, it, the way that we did it, was, it could kind of be just a bunch of people having a fever dream in an alley, you know? Um, because the play itself, uh, Macbeth, is a dirty, brutal, like, dark play. Um, and so setting it in kind of an era where the laws of man have kind of fallen away and things like that is, I think, very fitting it to the play itself. Um, you know, with them just kind of murdering each other left and right for power um, without any repercussions, really, except for the supernatural. Um, and also, I mean, as a small theater company, we don't have a huge budget. And so being able to pull from a bunch of artists and letting them kind of use either like we, we were pulling from a junkyard. Like we had we had this this big, was it a heater? I think it was a heater or something that was behind the throne, this giant like heater. We had tires and garbage cans and all sorts of stuff on the stage. And it, I mean, it worked, um, but it also allowed us to kind of uh, create a world that encompasses the play that we can afford. You know what I mean? Uh, it kind of goes to show with all of the plays that we've done, you know, with Hamlet, with, with Coriolanus and Hand of God and all the other plays that we've done. We don't need a huge budget to create great art. We don't. Uh, we don't, as much as, you know, we would love to have a $10,000 grant to do whatever we wanted. Um, we don't need it. Um, it doesn't mean we don't want it, but we don't need it. Um, so I guess I'm kind of going in a circle here, but uh, I pull from a lot of media sources and kind of whittle down what ideas, like with Myth Macbeth in particular, uh, if you've ever seen the more movie, The Warriors, and like, um, you know, warriors come out and play, yay, the guy with the bottle on his fingers, that, that kind of thing. Um, I liked the idea of having different tribes and things like that because bringing Shakespeare to a modern audience and talking about like wars between countries and stuff and the way that Shakespeare represented it, it it's sometimes out of reach for modern audiences with some of the concepts and things. It's, it's sometimes out of reach because monarchy and those type of things aren't really something we deal with these days or they're not really relevant anymore. So, um, you know, shows like Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings and those types of things where it's, you know, it, whoever kills who, whoever kills the other guy gets to be king. Uh, and setting in that kind of more brutal era, I feel like br made it easier and more accessible to uh, modern audiences and having the different clans and things like that um, allowed, you know, like we brought in a graffiti artist to make all of the, the symbols and things like that for each uh, different clan. And so um, just doing it in the post-apocalyptic era makes it just real enough that people can relate, but also just enough in fantasy that we can kind of do whatever we want. So. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, and Macbeth, um, and again, too, with the, like, And I had a great minute. AD. Stop it. <laughs> um, but yeah, with that, like, 90-minute concept, too, it's, like, the fast-paced in this, like, chaotic environment. It's, like, right. cool. It worked really well. In 90 minutes, like, he, he rises and then he falls. Boom, done. Yep. Um, so I guess that means it's my turn. Uh, so, hand to God, actually, before I pitched it as a director, um, 
I went to New York with my friend and he was like, do you want to see the show about a puppet with me? And I was like, no, not really. <laughs> so we, but like, I, I kind of did. Cause it sounded uh, like I read more about it. It sounded interesting. So we saw it on Broadway and it like, I had never laughed so much in my life, but then I also walked away and I like kept thinking about it. And I found myself like kind of ruminating on it, which a lot of times, like, you know, it's a, it's a comedy about a puppet. Like I didn't expect that. Um, so for a while, like I wanted to do it. I wasn't sure how, um, for a while we were going to find a director and like, just like produce it. Um, but then after working with BFR, it, uh, kind of became something I thought would really, uh, work with BFR because they were, you guys, um, we are really good at like creating opportunities, trying new things, doing things that are, uh, kind of can be like, I, I don't know, dangerous or different. Um, so I, uh, it, the timing actually was really interesting when it ended up happening though, cause it was right after Shakes and Co. And one thing about Hand to God that always really stuck with me was this idea that if you hold on to these emotions that you think are ugly, if you hold on to like anger and rage and grief and all these things because you don't want to show them because you think you shouldn't, those things will end up taking over you, which is kind of something that was big at Shakes and Co. It was all about like, you know, uh, getting in touch with your true self and your emotions, no matter, no matter how big they are, or how, you know, scary they can be. Uh, so coming off of that and doing Hand to God was really, um, it was really cool and I'm glad that the timing worked out that way because I feel like having that experience gave me new insights to the play that maybe, and it gave me a new connection that maybe I didn't have initially. Um, and as far as like a designer concept, um, I really like, this was something I pulled really personally, but I think that other people, like I knew that a lot of other people could also relate to it because like I used to go to Sunday school growing up. Um, and I used to be in those little dinky classrooms with the ugly walls and the cheesy posters and like the, the like silly trinkets, like we had our little Jesus bobblehead. Um, and I wanted this to be something that felt almost embarrassing to the kids sitting there because these are like 16, 17 year old kids and they're in like a middle elementary middle school room. So I felt like that adds to like the building of their tension, like they're changing, they're growing, they're feeling all these things. And then they're in this room with like a rainbow and children holding hands and saying, Jesus loves you. Um, so I wanted it to be almost like these kids to look silly sitting in the middle of this room. Um, so that's kind of like what the design idea was for it. Um, and yeah, uh, that's me. Um, so um, let's just, I'm so glad that you said that, like, that was the, the, the feeling that you were going for, for like, oh my gosh, like feeling embarrassed. Like that, that exactly describes like my experience when I was like sitting in the audience and like, yeah, that you, oh you God. That that's I'm fun. glad like just that I'm... awkward, like disconnect between like today, what? Like, oh, that's so, I'm so glad you mentioned that. That's really cool. Yeah, I'm glad that came off that way because, yeah, and it was it was so fun. I know Michael had a fun time with that set, and just it was like a lot of silliness with a little bit of like poignant, like meaningfulness that people could take away from it. Uh, all right, cool. Um, let's jump in to our next topic. Uh, so, um, we can kind of roll these into one if you want to talk a little bit about your casting process and um maybe like how a rehearsal might go or how you might work with a certain actor on a scene um i know andy touched on this so we can we can go in backwards order and i can start and um feel free to add more if you'd like to andy as well um but so i'll start with the auditioning process um for hand to god i I did, I did something kind of experimental and I think I would do it again. Um, because like as an actor myself, I find auditioning sometimes kind of rigid. Like you have to pick a play from this time period in this genre, a play you would get cast as your gen, your gender, your, all these things. And like, 
sometimes I've just connected with other pieces. Like I want to do a piece that a man did, or I want to do something from a movie. I don't know. Um, so I just opened it up to interpretation and let people bring in kind of whatever they wanted, especially for something that was like comedic. And I know it can be hard. You have to be really loose to be funny and to be in a for her to be in an audition is a very high stress situation where you're being judged so I wanted to make sure people came in with something that's that spoke to them and that they could have fun with and then also with uh with like Jason and Tyrone um that actor has to play two characters so I also give people the opportunity to like come in with a scene and play both characters which two actors actually did and it was wonderful and it was really cool um, and both of them ended up getting cast. Um, so I think that like doing auditions, like you really got to look at what show you have. And like, for me, it's like, I don't, I don't want people to feel stuck. I want people to come in because they're already coming into a stressful situation. I want them to be able to have fun. Um, and as far as a rehearsal process goes, I like, uh, I, I really like cheesy, like physical exercises. Um, like I, um, like there was one, like I took a Shakespeare class where we did all these in college where we did exercises. Like we would do like arm wrestling to a scene where you're building tension or just like, I like really physical things because I find that I personally as an actor get very in my head. And if I come into a rehearsal room and I have to be, I have to start by stretching or moving or doing an exercise, like I'm automatically listening to my whole self instead of just my brain. So I'd like to do, I like to do very physical things. Um, and I also like to start with a very collaborative environment. So like people come in, like when we start blocking, I let actors do their ideas too. And I kind of give them space to play. Like I'll put parameters and say, just kind of follow your instincts. Um, so yeah, that's that's how I like to run my rehearsals and my casting process. I like people to feel safe and comfortable because that's when you're willing to like take risks and do things that maybe you wouldn't have normally tried. Cool. Um, Alec, you want to go next? Okay. So uh, kind of like Andy said, um, uh, we have a very different uh, like casting process from time to time. Uh, we do traditional, for me personally, let me just speak for me. Uh, I do traditional auditions, um, calling people in, um, just seeing what they can do, what they like, what they don't like. Um, typically verse, I prefer if they come in with uh, something uh, in verse. And uh, I, I would personally prefer if they don't like do something to their type. Um, something that they're comfortable with this or comfortable with or that they really like is what I would prefer to see in an audition instead of like, this is my type because I look like this and this is what I get. No, I just, that's garbage. I don't, I don't want that. I want, I want something that they really enjoy, that they really like, that they feel passionate about. Um, and then once, once I've picked the group of people that I like that we will cast, um, we do the casting workshop. So, um, we bring in all of them into the room and take them through, uh, Every, every one of us who does the casting workshop is a little bit different. Um, for me personally, I like to get them moving, like to get them physical, play games, get them feeling silly. And the purpose of doing all of that is to kind of knock people out of the whole, like I'm at a callback, so I must perform and do, you know what I mean? There's certain expectations actors set on themselves when they go into an audition or a callback and they limit certain parts of their personality because they, it's a job interview. They want to get the job. You know what I mean? But they've already got the job. They're in the casting workshop. They've already got it. So I want to do away with all of that so I can see what they are really like in a large group of people and see how they interact, you know, um, because, you know, somebody who I maybe in their first audition wouldn't have pegged as a lead comes in and then in the casting workshop, they're a leader or they're really welcoming to other people in the room. And I can see that they could they could carry the the show as a lead. And so then that's how I decide instead of just kind of having ahead of time. Um, and I really don't adhere to gender or type or uh, any of that for the roles because I believe any in Shakespeare in particular and just in the world, anybody could do any part. Um, so if they show that they've got the stuff for it in the casting workshop, then I, then I give them the role. Um, and then as far as rehearsals go, um, I'm typically a little bit more free form as far as like the structure of things go, um, because I like to involve a lot of play in um, my 
rehearsals, a lot of exploration. Um, but uh, one thing that I'm a little notorious for in uh, my rehearsals and my shows is my circuit training. Um, the beginning of every uh, rehearsal, typically, unless it's like a text rehearsal, is circuit training. Uh, it's about the first 15 minutes of the rehearsal after the check-in. Uh, it's a circuit that starts off easy uh, and slowly builds its way up to be a little bit more difficult uh, to, again, alleviate those things. Because actors, we come in, me specifically, and just what I've observed, come in with such, um, what's the word? Like like a like an image, they they get in their heads. They 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 come in. They get you know they overthink. They had a long day. They drag everything rest like uh, with them in. And then when you get them moving and sweating and working out and counting together and doing all of these things, it kind of like one unites them as a group in mutual hatred against me for making them do this, but also uh, as a team and gets them physical and gets them sweating. Because Shakespeare, you can't do Shakespeare cold. You got to do it warm. Um, so getting them nice and hot uh, and nice and like sweaty a little bit and like you know uh just gets them a little bit charged up for the rehearsal um and um something else i like to do is i um um i like to have because of my work schedule recently i like to have late night rehearsals uh that we usually uh, like for henry we worked specifically on text so they were like two hour rehearsals and we would sit down and we'd work on just the text of the play. We wouldn't worry about blocking. We'd work, just talk about character development. So like four hours of the rehearsal process a week was devoted specifically just to character development and text work, while the bulk of the weekend rehearsals were working on assembling the play. So the, throughout the entire process, the actors still get to kind of work on these little details in these individual rehearsals without having to worry about it during like blocking and, and, and putting that all together. So. Um, yeah, that's kind of the, the bulk of me. So yeet. All right. Nice. And yes, we've all, all, all of us in this little chat have been through the circuit training. It's great. <laughs> I was in really Burpees good shape. Burpees are the best. <laughs> Burpees are the best. All right. Uh, let's, uh, jump into Sarah now. <laughs> so Alec, it was just funny when you're talking about like the, like circuit training, how you can't do Shakespeare cold like you got to do it like you got to be warm like we should have like a poster like if you're not sweating then you're not doing Shakespeare right or something like you got to sweat when you're doing Shakespeare um anyway that would be fun um but for me one of the like biggest I think one of the I wouldn't say it's the crux of VFR but one of the things that sets us apart from most people. And one of the reasons why I just like picked up and moved from Virginia to be here to do this was the auditioning and casting process. Because one of my, and it, it really like reared its ugly head during Hamlet specifically, because I knew going in that there were gonna be people auditioning because they weren't interested in telling the story they were interested in being Hamlet or in being Ophelia or in being Claudius. And you run into those people, right? Like they're more interested in hearing their own voice on stage than they are interested in being a part of a great story. So if the story you want to tell is the most important thing, then really you won't be disappointed if you're playing Marcellus or Bernardo or, you know, Horatio. You know, like I can't imagine anybody being disappointed in playing Horatio. He's the best character in my opinion. But, but like you get those people, and I, it was very easy to spot those people when the in the auditions for Hamlet because it's it's Hamlet, right? Like, it it, it was just very clear. But sometimes if you're doing something maybe a, a show like Coriolanus, you you don't really run into that problem maybe as much. Um, so just the the fact that the casting workshop really brings to the surface the people who are there because they want to be a part of a team and they want to tell a story that they believe in versus um, people who are just there for a credit on their resume. And, and I love the casting workshop, uh, like uh, similar to what y'all were saying that like I went in with like certain expectations, like, okay, I think this person or it'd be cool for this person and things totally changed. Like my top two people for Hamlet were people that I never really expected. But like the thing that made Brandon really stand out was like, okay, this guy wants to play. Like he's ready to play. He was ready to do ridiculous, ridiculous stuff. Like he got up 
it was, this was like at the, the audition workshop. He like got up on a chair, I think, and was at one point barking like a dog, like just ridiculous. Like, and like that to me, like that's courage. Like that's someone being brave because they don't care what they look like. They just want, they want to be a part of this team. And like the idea of team and putting the story first is like, so that's so important to me. Um, so that's something that I think that the casting workshop really, really highlights. And, um, as far as the, as far as rehearsals go, something that I, that I really love to do, um, like some of my fondest memories directing were doing like one-on-one -on -one text work and like monologue work because <clears throat> like, I don't know, it's all good. Like it's all, it's all tasty. It's all good stuff. But specifically working on monologues and like those smaller scenes, you can really like take apart the language and think about like, okay, like everybody knows the speeches here, right? It's not like anybody's gonna get lost because they're like, oh, to be or not to be like, oh, I better listen because I've never heard this before. Like most people know that. Um, even non-theater people know that. So it's more, it's less about like, okay, what is this speech about? But like, what is this speech doing? What is it doing? Like, where is it going? Are there pivots? Does it backtrack? Is does it go in a circle? And kind of speaking those things aloud and saying, hey, this goes in a circle. Let's do it going in a circle. And then kind of like physicalizing what the language is doing. And that, to me, it's like a puzzle that you get to do in real life. And um, I use, like I have it right here with me. Um, this is a great resource that I use. It's called a Shakespearean actor prepares and, um, it's by Adrian Bryan and Michael York, and it is so good. And I use this a lot as my guideposts for, um, teasing out the, the text and it's just, it's just so much fun. So, um, because I too, like uh, most actors, like I get in my head and I have this idea of like, okay, like it, it should be this way. Like that, that damn should monster, like it's poison. And <clears throat> um, sort of just game, being able to get out of your head and physicalize what the language is doing. So, you know, if you're, if, you know, to be is on this side of the room and not to be is on this side of the room, when you're arguing for this side, you're running over there when you're caught in the middle, you know, you're here and kind of just playing with that and it affects your body, it affects your voice. And yeah, it's just games, man. Just playing games. So that's what I love about it. That's what a lot of my rehearsals look like, <laughs> running around. <laughs> and that's like the coolest way to play with Shakespeare because it's poetry and it's so fun. So like, why not make it fun? All right, uh, Andy, let's, uh, let's go to you and if you want to yeah. add anything as well. Yeah, uh, there was a there's one or two things I wanted to add. I realized now that I had said a little bit of everything all off the bat, so I was like, oh shoot, I forgot to. There's going to be more stuff. Uh, but it it's also it was really great in the rehearsal and casting workshop process. Again, I I want to uh, how Sarah described it is is really really true. We see it every time where we get the people that we want to play with and then watch them play together. That way, instead of, you know, putting people in their little sockets, like how uh, Alec had described sometimes happens in the traditional casting process, uh, we allowed people to explore and see which part they really they really wanted to try and do. Uh, it's one of the, it's in our mission statement in as part of VFR that we wanted to create a inclusive space that allowed people to grow and explore and use the common vocabulary to learn. And that environment fostered that. And of course our, my, since my, my show was the only the second show we did, it was great to see it evolve into the step that it is now. Uh, from the very, very first one uh, uh, for Romeo and Juliet, all the way up till Henry, uh, this you know this past this past year, and seeing how all the same things just kept happening. Where we had an idea as a director, we're going, all right, I want you know this is gonna be this person, this person. I don't know about this person, but then people showed up to play, and then 
they were not only were they rewarded by getting something or getting a shot at something that they normally would never get the shot at, but the play benefited from it. And um, at least this happened for me, my vision became more realized because I had people who were more into their roles and more, they just, they just wanted to be there and they showed up for it. And when everyone wants to be there and shows up for it, uh, it just knocks the play out of the park. Um, my rehearsal process, again, I was, I'm looking over at my notes here. Um, I had, I'd written them down uh, every workshop. I, I took the play apart and then uh, every rehearsal, I wanted to do one of those chunks. And one of the, each one of those chunks, I had a little mini, mine was more workshop E, if that's a way to describe it, where there was like, okay, I want to try and do this thing this time. Uh, I want to try and let's explore status this this particular rehearsal. And then where does status employ? And I wrote down like, you know, where where did we leave off? Um, how do you, how do you how does uh, let's say how does Corey Alanis, how what's his status? And like, all right, well, Teddy, what's your status right now? And what's the difference there? And how to how do you bridge that gap? And it was. Um, getting to see the different ways that uh, individuals went and went about that casting and went about the goal of how do I change my status? What do I need to do here? And um, I wrote down a lot of questions. A lot of my notes in here are questions. And so it was, I collected a bunch of questions and then next rehearsal, I'm like, okay, here's some questions that I had. Let's try and answer them. Let's answer them. And then as we progressed through the rehearsal, uh, things got stitched back together. So then by the time we were at the very end, perfectly seamless show. So mm -hmm. that's that's what I wanted to add from mine. Awesome. Thank you. Um, you guys, uh, this has been great. And I'm really glad that like uh, we you've all offered some really informative and cool moments. Um, I know we're running kind of short on time here. Uh, so I just want to do one more quick uh quick time around and um leave us with one tip you have for new directors uh as, as to dealing with conflict or issues in communication and one fun like short little story or moment or special like story you have from from any of your shows that you've done um so i'll start um i think the most important thing for communication and with conflict is to make sure like you know, as the director, you are the leader. So it's just to make sure that people feel heard, but knowing when to like, knowing when to take charge and that you have the final say. So you make sure like your actors know the time and the place that they can reach out to you or your stage manager. And, um, you know, it's not during the middle of a rehearsal, it's, you know, after or before, and just always like being available to, connect with them and listen to them but know that like at the end of the day like you're making all the, the final decisions and you have to do what's best for everybody involved um and a fun little story I had two that came to my mind just now I'm trying to think of um I'll do the funny one instead of the uh the other one but uh so we were working with a squib during hand to god rehearsal and it was close to tech because we only had we only had two involved in the show and they're pretty simple um but i laid the tarp out on the ground and if you've ever been in the vfr room um it's like there's stuff all over the floor it's very artsy there's like chalk there were like chalk outlines still um so i spread the tarp out but it didn't go all the way and so when he popped the squib it went directly horizontal so it flew if the tarp stops here it flew over the tarp and then went straight down onto the floor and it is still there to this day so whoever's in that room next that's your problem now. um but yeah that was my fun little moment um alec do you want to go next yes uh so tip and funny story huh um the tip would be delegating is the most important uh, because as the director, you can, uh, this is a lesson I learned the hard way. As the director, you want to have your hands in all the pies and all the pots and everything. And, and because you're the director, it's your show. But you have to lean on the, the team you build around you. Um, you know, it's, it's a lesson, like I said, I learned the hard way. So just learn how to ask for help and learn how to delegate. And it will make your life so much easier. Um, so much, so much easier. Um, and a funny story that I have... 
Um, uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of funny stories. Um, oh my goodness. Uh, why does my brain go blank now? I think uh, it's not necessarily a funny story. It's it's a fun story in reference to blood again. It was the blood day for Macbeth where we were testing out all the different types of blood effects that we were going to have in the show. And the room looked, if you ever watched the show Dexter, it looked like a kill room from Dexter because we had tarps everywhere. We had tarps over everything. It didn't help. It still got everywhere. And there was this moment where we were, we like took a group video of us all popping a squib. Um, and so we all like, ah! Oh no, we lost him. Alex Frozen. Alec okay. is frozen and Dude. in the most hilarious face. <laughs> in the in the way that the squib was popped. Mm -hmm. And there he is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um so that's the we end can of the video. Well, that was my first that's reaction it. when he said squib was like, oh, a non-magical person. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh, my god. Wow. oh boy. Um, so I guess we'll just leave Alec like this until he comes back. Um, yep. and let's, let's, <laughs> let's let Sarah tell her story. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. I would like, I think I'm going to Shazam what Alec said about, oh, he's gone now. Uh, delegating. Hopefully he'll come back. <laughs> yes. Delegating and asking for help. Those are so important. And I'm back. Oh, he's back. He's yeah. back. Okay. 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 Back. All right. Um, where did I leave off? Squibs. All right. So Macbeth, Blood Day, Kill Room. Uh, we are all taking a group picture with the squibs and MCB, this like giant squib, because at the end when Macduff pulled his sword out, like it was like this giant explosion of blood, because why not? And so MCB came up to give me a hug, and then everyone came in for the group hug. So it was this giant blood hug, um, and it was like a movie from like a zombie, or a moment from like a zombie movie, as I'm surrounded by all these bloody people that were giving me a hug. That was that was just one of my favorite moments from that whole process. It was it was a good time. So that's my story. That's my tip. Bam. The blood hug. <laughs> oh yes. All right, Sarah. Now we can go back Those, to you. Like, B-rated horror movies. Like someone's film project from film school. Um, yeah, so Shazam's Alec, a Shazam Alex tip about communication, asking for help, and delegating. He, that's everything. That's everything. Um, the thing, like, probably the lesson that I learned when I was directing Hamlet was probably, like, stamina. And it's not so much a tip, but maybe like not like a warning or like um, checking reality, checking your expectations, and doing it out loud with someone who's going to be honest with you. Because um, like we we all need those people that are going to be in our corner, like yeah, you can do this, you got this, you're prepared, you know, this is going to be great. But like the next time I direct, I definitely want to have specific times maybe either at the beginning or at the end of rehearsals to check in with either my ad or my stage manager and speak my expectations for the week for the day out loud and then reality check those and say like okay like is this reasonable if we don't meet this what are we going to do and it doesn't have to be this long convoluted thing but just reality checking your expectations and that way you avoid resentments you avoid um you know, that, that the, the, the hurt that comes with unmet expectations. You don't feel bad for chasing people around when you ask for things because those expectations are clear from the beginning and they're realistic because you've checked them with other people. Um, and I can't think of like a funny, funny moment. Like I'm sure there were, there's so many probably. I mean, we were doing Hamlet for crying out loud. Like, it's a rock. It could be something, um, <laughs> something like meaningful too. Like so I think I special. The one the, a moment that like came to my mind when I was thinking about this before was when we got to work on seeing a scene from a monologue from Hamlet at Fringe Festival, when we were performing outside. It was like this like little alleyway, and we had done different scenes. You know, we did a scene from you know like Twelfth Night, and um, we the sword fight from Hamlet. We did other things too. But the ability, that was such like a cool memory, being able to like workshop 
the to be or not to be speech in this like alleyway where like Brandon had to contend with like cars driving by there was a siren at one point there were people coming and going that were like oh like what's going on here and like his desire to like connect with these people and to figure out like guys like I don't know what to do and it was like there were so many cool revelations that happened because we were in circumstances that were completely outside the realm of the play but it brought really cool discoveries anyway so that was just really fun it was a really great bonding team bonding memory for like not just the hamlet cast but for like vfr in general i think so yeah that stands out to me hey and yeah the fringe fests are really cool ways to just like revisit those shows and relive them it's really cool um all right andy uh we will finish up with you here all right, awesome. Uh, I guess I just, I definitely want to shazam what everything that you and Alec and Sarah have said. Um, being a newer director or someone who's only gone into the realm of directing really once, um, and it really speaks to the biggest thing I learned, which is you need to surround yourself with people who, who really not only care about the show, but care about, care about each other. Um, I've, I think I've said this literally at every single board meeting, at every single VFR thing. Uh, the people who work with us and the people who uh, work through us are our most valuable asset. If if you do that, then that's already that's most of the battle already done. If you have people who are willing to learn, if you have people who are willing to listen, communicate, and really just you know try something new, get out of that comfort zone, but in a way in which they grow as you know not only as a person but as an actor as a designer as a, a technician anything the results of that are really really great and really mind-blowing to me because i get very proud very it's almost like a it's the same feeling i would imagine a parent gets when they see their child accomplish something or like achieve something it's like the, yeah yeah look at that thing you did that thing you did right there, look how happy you are. Look at how happy everybody else is. And being able to see that um, on, a, on a scale happen, you know, almost what on average three times a year for the past four years is, is just incredible. It's just incredible. Seeing, the, seeing the, the amount of people who come together to do uh, the things that VFR set out to do. And yeah, so if there was a piece of advice I would have, surround yourself with good people and of course the triangle which is a combination that you need to build any sort of relationship any sort of anything and it's one of the things that i've used to guide uh myself and uh and as part of the company the company towards and that's you know trust respect and communication and form a triangle and when those three things are in balance and working together you have a very sturdy triangle moves onward and upward. And if one of the, there's a breakdown in one of those things, you know, a loss of trust can lead to not enough communication and then the communication drops the respect and it's just a mess. So find, find the time and find the space for people when you have a disagreement, you have to find the time. You can't just say, Oh, I'll do that later. You, you can't do that. You have to take responsibility, find the right people to help mediate, find the right place to mediate. You remove yourself from, from, the, from the war zone there uh, or from the battlefield and um, you go to some neutral ground and you talk and you make some ground rules about how listening needs to occur because, you know, it needs to happen. If you, I'm sure if you ask any dip, high, you know, high level diplomat or whatever, there's, there's ground rules that come in with any with any uh, um, negotiation or with any disagreement. And once those are there and you allow people to say what they need to say, uh, I've seen, I think 98% of the time, it all, it all just works itself out. So if you're a director and you find yourself up against that kind of, in that sort of situation, like what Alex said and what Sarah said and what Jess said, just ask for help. Cause there'll be people out there who want to help you who want to see you succeed and who don't want the show to fail and, and they will help you. So that's my advice that I would give. Try something new. You might like it.
And do you have any little fun stories from Coriolanus? Oh, uh, I know I said I know I said one before. Uh, um, I think with the with the shields and watching everyone just create. Um, probably. Hmm. Oh, there's so many. <laughs> It was uh, the it was one of the opening nights, uh, or it was no, it was the it was either the first or second performance of uh, no, no, it was opening night. It was opening night of Coriolanus, and I'm helping Jake uh, cut the individual paper tickets for <laughs> in the box office, um, which by the way I still have a couple of those, a rare rare fixture. So I'm I'm helping slice the. Uh, uh, the tickets and everything. I'm like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make all these. And, you know, this is going to be crazy. But Jake came in. He's like, hey, you know, dude, just don't worry about it. Just go out, just go out there, talk to the cast. You know, we'll, it will be, it'll be fine. And as soon as I went into the arcade theater, I'm like, you know, slightly dressed up. I'm like, oh, geez, I wonder if anyone, you know, is going to be ready for this. And every single person was ready. They were ready. They look on their face. They were so excited for the, to do the thing to see a vision realized it was it was it felt great here it felt really really great on the inside and that was mm, makes me makes me smile that's that's a happy memory there so yeah oh thank you mm -hmm. thank you guys all so much um for sharing your stories and your experiences and hopefully any um people out there who are interested in directing or getting involved in theater in any way. Um, hopefully you found, found something helpful or uh, something that you're going to take with you. Uh, so I just want to end this by uh, let's do our, um, our closing ritual that we do for all VFR shows um, and uh, rehearsals. Yes getting ready so and if you're with us at home feel free to join us um so what you're going to do is you're going to breathe in through your nose and you're going to clap your hands together and rub them together and thank you all so much for tuning in today and uh when i count down from three we're all gonna slap our hands down on the table on your legs on the floor and say that's us so three two one that's, that's us. us all right thank you guys bye, bye. thank you Thank you.